I do not want to suffer and I don't mean that I'm afraid of suffering. I, I mean, I, I, I have had things in life and there are the beautiful things that have made me and I, I don't have an issue with that. Right. But when you cannot have dignity and you cannot live mm -hmm. with dignity mm -hmm. and you are in terrible suffering, mm -hmm. physical, mental and spiritual, I will not, um, I will end it. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah, actually. I... So you know what? Now that we're speaking, I said, better make arrangements. <laughs>Welcome to What Matters Most, Believing Beyond Borders, a podcast series in the voices of the completed life, told from the perspective of three women, a TikTok influencer and life coach, an actress and playwright, and a rabbi in New York City. In each episode, we will hear the story of a woman who crossed over borders, state and national borders, emotional, intellectual, and spiritual borders to be with someone they loved and to arrive at a new understanding of what matters most. My name is Lynn Barger Elliott, and I am the executive producer of the Voices of the Completed Life podcast. Today, I'd like to welcome Didi Sanchez, who interviewed our guest, Beatrice Pisano. Didi is a member of the Completed Life Initiative Advisory Board and conducts research on Alzheimer's disease and the aging brain at Columbia University Irving Medical Center. Thank you for hosting this episode, Didi, and for helping us share this powerful story. Thank you, Lynn, for the opportunity to be a part of the series and giving voice to the stories of these brave and loving women. I had the privilege of interviewing Beatriz Pisano, a Colombian-born Canadian actor, director, and playwright. In 2019, she was recognized as one of TD Bank's 10 most influential Hispanic Canadians. Pisano tells the story of her life, including the death of her mother in Dividing Lines, the one-person play which she wrote and performed at Toronto's Aluna Theatre, where she serves as the artistic director. The play is the story of discovering what matters most, as Pisano crosses international borders to be with her mother, Julia. In her visits with her in the nursing home, Pisano discovers that Alzheimer's disease is building its own dividing lines and borders between their lives, their memories, and ultimately their ability to be present with each other. Yet, as she crosses these borders around her mother's bed, she discovers peace in Julia's death, joy in the laughter of her aunties, and even reconciliation within the thoughtful care of a physician. I'm in awe, and it's such a pleasure to be in your company, um, even when it's um, not, um, let's say it's not, we're not together physically. But um, I just uh, was very touched with, you know, the way that you intersperse Spanish and English language to describe yourself and your life experiences, you know, where you have both feet firmly planted among two cotton, you know, between countries, Colombia and Canada, and so much rich cultural history to explore there. And I learned um, a lot watching your riveting play, Dividing Lines. Thank you so much. And I also, you know, it's, it's interesting. Like when I first saw you on Zoom I, and we connected the first few words, I go, oh, no, Didi is like, we known each other for a long time. So it's a beautiful thing. And uh, this project is just taking me opening to places that I never imagined. So I work a lot with memory. There was a lot of Alzheimer's in, in, in one side of my family. Mm -hmm. And the, the the play that I did, the first play that I did with my mother as a subject was part of that uh, of that trilogy of women and war. And for me it was, uh, we lived in Medellin and we were from Medellin and there was, the studies showed that there was such a high incidence of Alzheimer's in that part of Colombia in Antioquia. And so I went like, hmm. I, I remember my mother, my my grandmother screaming. My grandmother had Alzheimer's. It's just I didn't we didn't know it at that time. The, the years of the violence in Colombia were terrible. But I saw these generations of running away from war, and then I just went. I wonder about the relationship of Alzheimer's and war, like because is is 
wouldn't you want to forget? You know, so so with that, I started writing that that play, my second play of that trilogy that was called Madre. I never thought that I would write this third last piece, um, uh, Linias. I never thought I would write Divide in Life. You, you wrote that in while well, you were in Colombia or in Canada? And no, in like uh, that one, I did it here, and it took me some years. I could write it after my mother died. It was. Um, I think it's um, um, her death. My mother's journey has given me the most <laughs> to most to to create artistically, and uh, I think it's still a thing that is being really hard, you know. And uh, she's still so much so present. Like I, I still have dreams that I like a lot less each time, but dreams in which the Alzheimer's has disappeared. So I go, oh, okay, so I can take her out of the home. But mm -hmm. what am I going to do? You know, it's like it's so interesting, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, um, I saw a lot of suffering in the old people in my family throughout. They, they That side of the family didn't have, like, really mm -hmm. good um, old age, you know. And I was going, like, oh, I have friends that they're – their grandmothers are 98 years old and they're like doing so well but there was something about that family that that had so much uh, um alzheimer's what now after i did so much research on alzheimer's I said that's what they had they all suffered from alzheimer's you know so um suffering was something that i knew it was not mm -hmm. something i i wanted right yeah. and and so some of those early conversations after learning that your mom was diagnosed with AD, how did those now, how did that history, knowing that there was that history with your, fam your, your family, how did that impact now your, or let's say preparing or, or learning how to navigate your mom's journey with dementia? Well, you know, it's like they do tell you that things are going to get bad, but you don't, believe it or understand it until you get there. Mm -hmm. And so at the beginning, it's kind of even funny. They have the most funny memories or things, you know. But then as years go by, it is, you know, I remember one of the doctors told me it gets to a point where they don't even, they cannot even walk or anything because the body won't know how to. Mm -hmm. But until you're there, mm -hmm. you have no idea. And for me it was... If I had seen my mother in a place that was like, you didn't see suffering, but the suffering was so apparent. I mean, she lived in terror, in terror, in the fear that, and she was giving these antipsychotic drugs and then they would up the doses because they didn't care. You know, at that point, it's like, that's how they were treating them. And I, I just went like, I just go, I don't even know what her poor head is going through with all these right. drugs, you well, know. And a lot of despair. And sometimes, you know, you grew up with families who were afflicted. You recognize that, yeah. what it was. But it was then described as Alzheimer's, I think. I think yeah. a lot culturally, yeah. um, in many cultures, right, we say, you know, their person is senile or the person, you know, it's just aging, old age. But then when you learn that it has a name, Right. And then you see it now, you know, personally impacting you. So, yeah. and, then, and, and mm -hmm. the culture that I come from, it particularly, mm -hmm. is not everybody. And maybe mm -hmm. not, you know, you can only speak from your mm -hmm. experience. But mm -hmm. there was a thing in, in and I think it, it, it had to do with something cultural, uh, the mm -hmm. part of Colombia that I came from, and that we seem so outgoing and that, but things you don't reveal to the world what's going on in your household. Right. You really don't. Everything right. is kept in secret. Yeah. Right. My so, family was so secretive. Like, you know, I was going, you know, and so you, outside your eye, you know, I can eat that. Everything is so good. And, you know, but, yeah. you know, and even then, like the, the society has changed a lot. But if, mm -hmm. you know, people who had any disabilities were hidden at home. Right. Know? Yeah. Because of maybe, um, You'd shame or maybe shame, you'd totally, be yeah. a stigma, right? Yeah. Um, this is yeah. a family that has that. And, you know, and also I, I love that you said that you just don't know once you're there. You just don't know. 
And, you know, there's, you know, I know that there's within Colombia at that time in Canada, they were completely opposites regarding medical aid and dying, right? But this is something that you just don't know. Like, you know, countries take sides and, and, and they may have different ways of, of addressing, you know, um, medical and dying. But this is something that unless you're there, you really uh, may not know what decision you'll make, right? Or how you would want your loved one to face uh, a disease like Alzheimer's disease. Yeah, and that's why the play, because in my situation, mm -hmm. uh, my mother could no longer make the decision. So mm -hmm. it was something that we didn't plan for mm -hmm. when she had the ability to at least, but I don't, that ability was lost so long ago, you know, really, mm -hmm. you know, because, you know, when, when I really said, oh, I have to put my mom in a home, like mm -hmm. things are not well, because I lived in Canada and she lived in Colombia. So I wanted to talk in the play about, I guess, in a way, I always touch on immigration things that, you know, like when I immigrated, I never thought my parents are going to get old, right? Like those are things you never foresee. Yeah. Now that I'm entering um, uh, maturity, <laughs> <laughs> I, you right. know, like uh, it's been like for the first time, I'm thinking there's a finality to things. Mm -hmm. And that's a very new thought for me, right? Because I've been such a warrior of always, you know, and so I take everything as a, my mother said some beautiful things when, because the, the incredible thing about that illness is that the, the moments where she was lucid were like talking to a philosopher. The moments that she understood what was going on in the process and she said, I'm just terrified, but the next phase of my life is here. I'm just afraid, you know? Mm -hmm. And so when she first moved into the home, that she could be present and not present, but, you know, I could still have conversations with her. Mm -hmm. It was the thing that she said, look, I don't want you to come back to Colombia, anything. I have already lived my life. This is yet time for you to live your life. So she was so beautiful and generous in that way. Um, because I didn't know how to, you know, I, I didn't know anymore how to make money in Colombia or anything. Mm -hmm. I, I guess you can always find your way, but I, I found I'm an artist, you know, <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I don't even know how I'm going to do it from here. But, you know, the beautiful thing is, um, everything like my mm -hmm. art just began to flourish during that period. And I was able to support her and, uh, and be there for her until the end, you know, even from a distance, which is very, is very challenging. I mean, that's, that's one of the things that are very, very hard about, I think, um, immigration. And if your, mm -hmm. your whole family is in another place, because I came yes. by myself, I was going to come here to study and, uh, but then I stayed, you know, yes. I just went like, Oh, I like it. And I want to keep doing this. And I could, you know, and I started working at the university right away. So I was like, I'm free. You know, <laughs> I don't have to depend on my families. Like, you know, it was beautiful. It was my time to embrace life. And, uh, uh, but yeah, so, so it was the play for me was those situations as an immigrant, always looking at it. Mm -hmm. Also, going what happens when you cannot make a decision and at the time i mean laws are beginning to change mm -hmm. but at the time that i wrote the play or this happened in 2012 really is when it happened i couldn't write the play for like five or six years um alzheimer's and uh, illnesses like alzheimer's were not part of of many of the places where where euthanasia or or, or you know i i like to use that word um um was allowed you know so right. so that was still like if you cannot make the decision yourself you cannot have it and i'm going but mm -hmm. what about if you cannot make the decision that was the okay. dilemma of the piece if you, how do you make a decision for somebody you love mm -hmm. so deeply um and i guess in the way that's when you become almost a parent because it's like mm -hmm. when parents have to make these decisions for kids you know mm -hmm. uh, that you know, the, the, the kids cannot make it. So that was the, I think, um, the, the most challenging part 
uh, for me. So I, I think as the laws are opening, like mm -hmm. if there's consent ahead of time, I know mm -hmm. in Colombia now, if you can prove if that person didn't leave anything, but if you can prove mm -hmm. that that was the desire of a person, then, then mm -hmm. it's okay. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, yeah, I think planning is, um, is a good thing. And I just, you know, for me, the play was also very important to say, talking about death reaffirms so much life. You know, it is, mm -hmm. if we can look at death, we can really mm -hmm. understand how beautiful life mm -hmm. is and how, how to take it all mm -hmm. and, and take it with all the respect and, mm -hmm. you know, and, uh, because we're all going to die. That's, right. that is, that's the one thing that is, mm -hmm. we're all going to get there. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So, but we have such a taboo around dying or talking about it. Mm -hmm. And, and, and so mm -hmm. I think the more we can face it, then we can help people get there because, you know, like, mm -hmm. um, you know, there are times that people will not survive if there's no medical intervention, right? So, right. but the families, it's always like I had a, a doctor that was a great, great guy and um, helped me a lot through this process. And, and mm -hmm. it, you know, it is, it is us who don't want to let go. Right. Even in the last moments with her as she's mm -hmm. taking her, her last breaths uh, or last breath. He made me get out of the room because he said it was his interpretation. And he says, she's seeing right now the little girl oh. and she's not wanting to let go. Oh, you know, touching. yeah. So there were so many beautiful, very spiritual, you know, whatever your belief is, you know, but I, I do believe in that, that we we will grab on to life until the last moment you know yes. actually i was going to ask you something about that i know that the catholic faith was highly influential growing up <laughs> and i wanted to know how you navigated that you know and and in what ways did religion or spirituality influence your end of life decision making and and i'm um, and i would love to to know more but i love how you said you know there like an angel and and you were this little girl so how, how did that influence you or not at all um your, oh. your road with your mother yeah well i just um i don't know there were so many signs i i think i mean the catholic church i thought i was an atheist <laughs> <laughs> and i still am uh, but when i'm talking to this doctor and he says what are you so afraid of like mm -hmm. being punished by god i said i don't believe in god and he says oh you were born in a Catholic country, it's in your DNA. And I just, you know, I just went, hmm, guilt? Of course, <laughs> guilt always comes, you know, like Catholic is mea culpa, mea culpa, mea grandissima culpa, yeah. right? So, uh, but I don't know. Um, he said something so beautiful. He said, if God existed, mm. I guarantee you that he would not believe in this suffering. You know, so I guess our interpretations of God, I don't believe, I said like, there's a piece, the part in the piece that I said, what do be, I believe in? Life. Mm -hmm. And life for me, it was, it's also, when I say life is death as well, you know, mm -hmm. so um, I, I, I never doubted that I was doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. It was that confronted with that decision and confronted with death, I think regardless, is, if we had more preparation, if we had some more um, things that prepare a ceremony or whatever you want, some rituals, because it is hard, you know, it is hard to let go, right? It is, it, it is, uh, I mean, when I saw my mother lying on that bed and, and, and the doctor said, look, stay with her, the whole, all the aunties, the same aunties of that memory arrived that morning out of the blue. They hadn't visited my mother in months and months. Mm -hmm. I'm at the dentist and I get a call from the nursery, from the, the home and they said, like, your mom is, is agonizing, like, 
the breathing is starting. You got to get here. So I, I, I didn't even finish the dentist. I ran to there and suddenly I see all my aunties coming and say, oh, how is your mom? We just coming to visit. And I go, this is what's going on. But so the doctor said, look, uh, he believed in these things. He says, don't allow them to move the body for four hours. Mm -hmm. Stay with her in the room, all of you, all the women, and just mm -hmm. celebrate her life and laugh. <laughs> Talk about all the great things, you know, with her. <laughs> And I I remember that I could not stop caressing her and it didn't feel she was gone. And it was the peace that I felt. And I felt my mother in peace for the first time in so long mm -hmm. that I said, like, I am alive and I will deal with my emotions and mm -hmm. my journey is my own because we all react to things differently with all the histories that we carry within mm -hmm. us. And the and her loss was a, a very deep loss for me. And mm -hmm. um, but that's my journey. It's not hers. Oh, and I, I feel your. I mean, I I am miles away from you, but I actually feel your love. Um, and I feel that whatever does happen, right after life, and and just knowing that you were there to celebrate along with your aunties, and 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 that is a ritual that you know should exist, and yeah. whatever choices we make at yeah. end of life. And I'm glad that you had that experience. And and I mean, I had a friend, another friend in Bogota, that she was very. She decided to terminate her life, and she prepared all her friends for mm -hmm. a month. Everybody came to visit and say goodbye. And I went like, if we can do this preparation, it's so beautiful, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And. Um, and again, I mean, I know myself and I will fight for life until I cannot fight anymore. But I also want to be very clear that there's a moment, I guess it's like in theater that you go, no, this is it. Yeah, <laughs> the curtain. We got to open the yeah. play. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, no, no more bows. No more, and no more changes. It's <laughs> like, at least for tonight, this is it, you know? So there's a time that you also know when the creation is done. Right. Yes. Your next creation will be different, but that moment and I, I do not want to suffer and I don't mean that I'm afraid of suffering. I, I mean, I, I, I have had things in life and there are the beautiful things that have made me and I, I don't have an issue with that. Right. But when you cannot have dignity and you cannot live mm -hmm. with dignity mm -hmm. and you are in terrible suffering, mm -hmm. physical, mental, and spiritual, I will not, um, I will end it. Okay. Yes. Oh, I actually, I... So you know what, now that we're speaking, I said, I better make arrangements. <laughs> I leave everything for the last minute. I go, it's like, it's, you know. It's amazing how these conversations, you know, we are talking about our past and our present. But then they kind of lead us down that road, right? The future. What does the future hold for us? And and where are we at the present time? You're in Canada. You're in a place that right now is going through many changes. It's been very supportive of medical, you know, of, of uh, medically ass ass assisted dying. But now, even now, it's actually there are some places. Quebec is expanding its program of medical and dying to allow advanced requests for people like yourself. Um, and it has been contested yet, you know, the federal government, but just to know that there are, you know, this is something that um, places like in Canada are considering. I offer my story, not to say this is what you should do, but just as, as a, you know, for you to, to know somebody who has been through that and who has made that decision. I was thinking today, funny enough, well, not funny because we, we're having this, <laughs> we, with this, this conversation and that, but I was thinking, okay, here I am, a person who doesn't have any children. And uh, I'm just inventing this as we talk. And I am, you know, I don't know where I'm going to be. Am I going to be here? Am I going to go back to Colombia? I have no idea, right, what the future is. Right. But I was going, okay, if I make this arrangement, who is going to carry it out? If I'm going to ask my friends or any of my friends to carry it out, mm -hmm. as we're speaking, I'm thinking that's where we start, should start preparing people. 
Right. So it's not something that comes out of nowhere for somebody, yeah. but how we can like what I'm uh, now what I'm doing is making sure I have a very beautiful community of friends mm -hmm. and dad building that community. But I go, wow, they deserve to be mm -hmm. if I make this choice, they deserve to know that that's my choice. And if it ever happened, that, mm -hmm. that they're the ones who are going to carry it out mm -hmm. if I cannot do it. And you're right, we maybe are having those kind of conversations. And what does that look like yeah. uh, and as we get older? Yeah. What, what does our community look like? And and I think you have places like Completed Life, right, that can expand those narratives and, and help us see what's out there and what those choices can be. It's very important that I have the choice of how I want to get out of this world. That's key for me. Nobody has a saying about that. That's my human right. I'm just going to be very honest, very honest and, mm -hmm. and very honest about what happened and why I made the decision. Because mm -hmm. um, the laws were different at the time that this is going on in Colombia. So let's leave it at that. You know, yes. it was something it was something I did. And I love your use of laughter and humor to talk yes. about, you know, such a complicated subject of euthanasia. How did humor impact or influence your recollection of your mother's dying process? You have just an infectious laugh, too. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I didn't even intend to be funny, but there's <laughs> funny things because life is very funny, even in yeah. those moments. Yeah. I mean, I remember when... Uh, my cousin that I didn't want to put her in the play. I, I, I respected that, mm -hmm. but a person who helped me so, so much. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, when my mother takes the last breath and that, and, and so I go out to inform everybody, mm -hmm. her and I just hold hands and start running down the corridor. Mm -hmm. and, we're, and then we start laughing, you know, it's like out of, relief and also and then when we sat with my mother when she had passed in that room mm -hmm. my god the stories about my mother that were so funny we were all peeing our pants mm -hmm. so this is the beauty about life that that i think death doesn't take away death doesn't take away anything right. i really i really anything that the people who are left are feeling like grieving is an important part of life it's part of life. We're grieving all the time. One thing, whether it's a, mm -hmm. it's a, you know, as as a new decade, you begin a new decade. You, you know, like now that I'm entering again, uh, mm -hmm. and maturity. There are times that I had to grieve the woman, mm -hmm. the young woman that I was leaving behind. You know, mm -hmm. I, uh, I, I found when I was going through menopause, it was a grieving of of. I didn't even notice it, but. but <laughs> But it was a grief, and I remember one day going, oh, I'm not going to bleed anymore. And it's, you know, it was a beautiful thing if we, if we recognize the faces of life, you know, it's like, of course you grieve. You're entering, I think what is so scary about mm -hmm. death is the unknown, that nobody knows. Whatever you believe happens after is beliefs, but nobody knows what happens. Yes. And as humans, we're so terrified of the unknown, and we are in our daily lives. When we start a new project and we're terrified, like, because we don't know, you know, so it's a constant of that unknown. Now, the end in mind, given your love-filled journey with your mother, your experience with her suffering, do you have your own criteria of what your completed life looks like and what it means to you? You know, I haven't thought about it. <laughs> it's so interesting because, again, I think it's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. At some levels, you don't want to face it, even though I have gone through it. I'm being very honest. I haven't made, I've only said it out loud. I don't want to suffer, you know, mm -hmm. you know, but I haven't made any, any official preparations and I should, because I, I, if I cannot think for myself, if they're suffering, I don't want to be, and I don't want the people around you to suffer either, because that's the other thing that, you know, the person that is dying also do, doesn't want the people around them to suffer. I know that. I don't know how, but I know that. Mm -hmm. it's, it's like nobody wants that, right? Is mm -hmm. is So caring for people who are living under these really difficult, horrible 
um, situations, we also have to acknowledge how hard it is for the caretakers. It's, it is very hard. It is very hard. And we don't often talk about that. You know, the person who is on their way out, it's like my mom said, I already lived my life. I mean, in my in my mother's case, mm -hmm. she's an older woman. This situation mm -hmm. is a very different thing when we're talking about young people and people who have to make those decisions must be really, really hard, you know? But, um, you know, and uh, yeah, but I, I, I do want, um, <laughs> I think I'm going to do something right after this interview, but yeah, no, I do want to plan it and, and make yeah. give some some document where it says where I, yeah, how yeah. I want to go. Yeah, and that's, yeah. And that's liberating, it's like yeah. water, right? It, there, yes, it, yes. And, uh, you know, like um, I survived the cancer when I was very young and I go, I don't know if I would go through another one if it happened, you know, like... Mm -hmm. I was 24 when it first happened, so I had my whole life ahead of me. Now I go, I would think before I put myself through a lot of things, what kind of ending do I want? You know, is is because I go to be chopped to pieces to live six months, why? You know, for yes. me. Yes, of course. You know, of course, again, until you're there, you have no idea. You know, right. but if I cannot make a decision, I do want to be able to leave a, a paper that allows somebody else to say this is what this person wants. Yeah, yeah, and and as you go towards that, I cannot, um, I cannot, you know, s stress how impactful um, your play, Dividing Lines, is. Um, because just your narrative, your one woman narrative, which I found very impressive as well, written and directed, I mean, written by you and acted, um, I, I think that it really does open the door for, you know, what, you know, choices, you know, we'd have and, and how, what values, right? What values drive our decisions? And I think that that is what I took my biggest takeaway from watching your show your um was that it's just the beauty and, and the laughter of you know having a say and you know how you complete your life yeah. and as a woman for me that was very important oh yes it was very important because whether you know we are supposedly the the, the givers of life right so that death was another life you know, in, 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 in the same way, and whether you can have children or not, that doesn't mean anything, the female energy, you know, so I went, it's important that it comes from that energy, walking the earth with this energy, um, there are things that go, there's a way that I look at life and that we look at life with a very different lens, you know, and, uh, and that, that voice doesn't get hurt often enough right or and if if it gets produced and that you know we know just in the in the business that we are like women you know or female voices you know um and i i couldn't think of any other way for our conversation to end uh something that i do not want <laughs> I, I learn more but just you know to have that that female empowerment right and something that has has eluded especially in patriarchal societies like yeah. you know colombia to yeah. this day even when their rules are you know even when they're when they expand their views or laws on medical aid and dying there's still a lot of places where women don't have much of a say yeah. in, in what happens or or um even though the choice is there it's really hard right or nearly impossible to exercise those choices and I'm glad that you said that, that your play is really, you know, female, um, has female energy. And yeah, and I don't know what that is also, because <laughs> it's such a beautiful time in life right now. But if if I'm going to use any word, that energy of, you know, not from the from that patriarchal lens, right? Yes. And so that we go to the beautiful things that that energy is, which we all have it both you know whoever identifies men mm -hmm. uh, 
male or female we have the two the two energies or more mm -hmm. right but mm -hmm. you know and i think as an artist that's what, very important for me mm -hmm. not to escape from something but say no this is this is how i see it me right so mm -hmm. and and i have a space i'm lucky enough to have a space to have produced this play the opportunity to write the play so you know i got to do something with that you know if i if i'm privileged enough to have a space to use it well thank you thank you for your time i really appreciate beatriz pisano i i you're not only i think a shiro to to me and many other women out there who are who find ourselves usually most of the time being you know the caregivers um and i do want you know to to just say thank you for uh -huh. So feeling that force and that energy and the strength um, that it takes, but knowing that you love and the love that you showed for your mom as your your play evolved, we can see that in all your actions. So it's a blessing, and I thank you for your for your words of with wisdom today. Oh, thank you, Didi. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for joining us for the second episode of What Matters Most, Believing Beyond Borders. Please join us October 30th as we interview Rabbi Rachel Timoner of Congregation Beth Elohim in Brooklyn. Timoner was featured in the Emmy Award-nominated film Last Flight Home, which tells the story of her father Eli's choice for medical aid in dying in California. Last week's podcast with Allie Tate Cutler, model, coach, and social media influencer, as well as our other episodes from Voices of the Completed Life, can be found on our website, completedlife.org. Medical aid in dying is an end-of-life option that was legalized in Canada in 2016 and in Colombia in 1997. Currently in the United States, it is legal in 10 states, plus the District of Columbia, and is only available to those who have received a terminal diagnosis with six months or less to live. On behalf of the Completed Life Initiative, thank you for listening.